Good afternoon. I'm Jim Eskin, and as founder of Eskin Fundraising Training, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 125th Nonprofit Empowerment Webinar and the inaugural episode for our fall 2024 season. Let me introduce our subject matter expert. The topic is major gifts ramp up. And we think that's so important because I think everyone in resource development will agree on this. We won't agree on everything. Your nonprofit is not going to realize um, its true gift income potential without a robust major gift program. And we have a expert that uh, has given literally hundreds of presentations to nonprofits of all different sizes. Uh, Lewis Fawcett is president of National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives. That's the last time I'm going to endure saying that. If it's okay, Lewis, I'm just going to call it NANO, okay? And he is also president of PAX Global and a senior counsel for Development Systems International and a National Development Institute faculty member. And I'm going to stop there. Okay. He also is ordained as a, or a Lutheran pastor. So Reverend Fawcett, but he says it's okay to call him Lewis and not Rev. Uh, had more than 20 years experience leading churches and nonprofit organizations and offers a unique set of faith-based domestic and international leadership and fundraising skills. And conservatively, he estimates he's raised several hundred million dollars for a wide variety of good causes. So we couldn't be more pleased to have Lewis as our guest. Thank you, Lewis, for sharing us. And also thank you for the leadership you have provided the nonprofit sector. Uh, before we go to our barrage of questions, Lewis, uh, by the way, John, I'm forgetting, put up a slide. I got to promote a book. You know, we've done uh, 250 of our either live or virtual workshops. And I think you know, most of our nonprofits fall in the middle, uh, smaller to middle range. And what we hear most about is getting a million dollar gift, getting their first or next million dollar gift. And a book I have is going to be available uh, November 12th, but it can be pre-ordered. And we have a special deal now. John, can you show the, um, the um, what happens when you click there? You go to our book distributor, and we are giving a two-for-one special. Uh, you get both my first book, which was 10 Simple Fundraising Lessons, and you get this new book, uh, How to Score Your First or Next Million Dollar Book. Okay, uh, Lewis, uh, are you ready to begin our fun? Yes, let's get going. Okay, let's start from square one. How would you describe the difference between a high-performing nonprofit and a nonprofit that really doesn't meet that standard? Yeah, a high-performing nonprofit is focused on treating its donors like its customers. And they are prioritizing their time to spend more time cultivating major donor relationships. We know that if you prioritize your time toward major donors, and you orient them to the work that you're doing, what you're accomplishing, the lives you're changing and saving, and how much it costs, then you're helping them to achieve their goals when they invest in your nonprofit. So a high performing nonprofit sees itself as a philanthropic advisor where they are the liaison between the needs of the community and the needs of the donors to give versus a nonprofit that is underperforming uh, that focuses only on their programs. And they take on the mindset that if they work harder, harder, harder on more programs, 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 then somehow the money will drop out of the sky. And so you will never accomplish your mission and achieve a heroic mission of scale without focusing on your major donors. Hey, I, uh, I, I goof for a moment, which I do often. I also, I always like to ask my special guests, 
a what I call a personality question. And I did a little Google research on um, on Lewis, and he's very proud. He has a Corvette. And by the way, we are muting this to the South Carolina State Troopers. Can you tell us the fastest you've gone in your Corvette? 127, but it felt like 57. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Wow. You have made philanthropy part of your adult life. What would you say has, hasn't has changed and what has changed the most? Well, what hasn't changed is uh, uh, people. Uh, people are, are people and they still desire connection. They still desire to be listened to to be valued. Uh, they want to be able to invest in the lives of others. So that hasn't changed. What has changed is the way we interact with each other. And I think part of the challenge we're facing in this race for technology is we're being told that we can interact with each other in better or somehow more meaningful ways than the old fashioned way of sitting down face to face. And we certainly have wonderful tools like social media and Zoom that we're using right now to get to know each other and convey information. But there is no substitute for sitting yeah. down with someone face to face. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly when you're talking about a major gift, right? Exactly. OK, let's move to I know a question you're going to like. Along uh, with Jimmy LaRose, you're very proud for establishing Nano. Could you take a few minutes to share some of your most proudest accomplishments with Nano? Sure. So the nonprofit uh, association, the, the National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives is a macro effort to change and disrupt the nonprofit sector. And we believe for far too you, long. Can you repeat that? Did I hear you say to change and disrupt? Did I hear those words? Yes, to change and disrupt the nonprofit. Wow. wow. Because, because. Because for far too long, what nonprofits have been told about how they should run their nonprofit is wrong. Mm. And it no longer works in 2024. And so we started Nano in order to take what we know works in the free market uh, arena and put it to work in the nonprofit arena. And one of those principles is uh, focusing on your customers and running your organization like a business and uh, applying sound free market principles in order to grow your mission and your revenue. You know what comes to mind? I forget who came up with the quote, but the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. And I guess you're saying that's very, very visible in the nonprofit sector. Right. I mean, asking your board to fundraise uh, worked great 60 or 70 years ago when your board members were Ford, DuPont, Rockefeller, and Vanderbilt. <laughs> uh, but, but now... There are over 1.5 million nonprofits in this country. And when someone says to you, well, you just need to get a better board, uh, it's insanity because you're going to end up with the bank vice president. And we love the bank vice president, but the reality is she's 42 years old. She's got three kids. She doesn't make that much money. She's trying to climb her way up the corporate ladder, and she can't connect you with wealthy individuals. So there just aren't enough wealthy people who are willing to serve to go around to make up all these boards that are out there. And so what we promote is that an organization should be run by a strong CEO. And when it's run by a strong CEO, then she's in charge of setting the vision, growing the mission, growing the revenue of the organization. And the board needs to support her in her vision, or if they don't agree with her, they can find another CEO, but it's not the job of the board to supervise the CEO. Yeah. Hey, let's dig a little deeper there, okay? I'm intrigued by that. Can you tell us, so what should a CEO be empowered to do on his or her own, and what type of checks and balances should be placed on the power of the CEO? So the CEO should be in charge of setting two goals every year. 
Okay. One for growing impact and one for growing revenue. Okay. Those are the only thing, two things that matter, right? There are only two sides yeah. of the equations, it's expenses and revenue. So if you spend more, you should be growing your impact. If you bring in more, then that leads to being able to spend more to grow your impact. So, so the CEO should set two goals at the start of every year. Here's what we plan to do to grow our programs and services to serve more people and uh, more broadly and more deeply. And then here's our plan to grow revenue. And then the board should back her and support her yeah. in the plan and then evaluate her after a year based on that plan. Yeah. Uh, rather than try to micromanage or insert their ideas about what ought to happen with the organization because they've hired a CEO and they need to let her do her job. By the way, and that's what corporate America has been doing. And it's created millionaires, billionaires, and soon trillionaires. So it certainly worked in the corporate sector, right? Exactly. And it, it, the, the whole idea that you're going to have a board that supervises you yeah. is ludicrous. Most board members have never thought about your organization uh, before they come to the meeting. And uh, a third of them are not interested in being there at all. A third of them will show up and, and be like mannequins. And a third of them are really engaged, but it still doesn't mean that they should control or run the organization. That work needs to be left to the CEO. And by the way, aren't they really, all of them are occupied with other worries in their personal and professional lives. A hundred percent. They have lives of their own. They have things that they're uh, thinking about. They join boards to serve the community and have fun and network, not to be saddled with a bunch of tasks uh, with which they're not equipped to accomplish. Yeah. Okay, let's dig in a little deeper on this board, okay, issue. Um in the roles they can and maybe should not play in fundraising. Uh, what do you mean by board members um, should not be fundraising? Uh, you know, I we're going to dig in. There's discovery, there's cultivation, there's solicitation and stewardship. Are there appropriate roles for the board to play in the resource development arena? Yes, if they want to. Uh, so we believe in creating a, a cabinet of veteran fundraisers who take charge of and assist with the fundraising for the organization. So these are volunteers who each agree to take responsibility for, say, five or six relationships and get the staff into conversations so that they can grow their relationships with major donors. And if boards want to serve in that capacity, if board members want to serve in that capacity, that's wonderful. We just see over and over again, CEOs, executive directors, directors of development, bringing to their board this requirement to do fundraising, this requirement to sell tickets to the gala, this requirement to make connections. And most people don't want to and aren't equipped to do that when they join a board. Yeah. We prefer to recruit a cabinet of volunteer fundraisers who help with that function. Yeah. Another, you are a little different in some ways. Um, you also advocate paying board members. Can you say, have any nonprofits adopted that uh, practice? Well, uh, so what we advocate is honorariums for our board. And so a little deeper. what does that mean? So three hundred dollars for every uh, virtual meeting and a thousand dollars for every in-person meeting. We have four meetings a year. Three of them are virtual. One of them is in person. So we're talking about nineteen hundred dollars a person as an honorarium. And what we get at Nano is 100 percent participation in our board simply because we offer them an honorarium for their time and expertise that they're lending to our organization. So we are suggesting that nonprofits can also offer honorariums to board members to appreciate them for their time. And the, the question really becomes whether or not you choose to pay board members 
which board members would you get rid of if you had to pay them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, Randa, you had a related question on this issue. That strikes me. I, I like the idea, but I mean, that's, is that something we're really, we're allowed to do? Nonprofits, that's all legal, that's fine. Absolutely. And then, is there any difference? We pay consultants. Is there any difference? Because what you're really saying is paying the board members for their expertise, right? Right. Correct. We're, Just we, like a lawyer or a CPA or whatever. Yeah, we want a lean board made up of six subject matter experts, a legal expert, a marketing expert, a fundraising expert, uh, an expert in, in the subject area of our nonprofit. And when we narrow that, uh, an accounting expert, when we narrow that to six board members who are subject matter experts and we offer them an honorarium for our time, we're not violating um, any IRS uh, law. Uh, we're certainly violating the traditional view of what it means to serve on a nonprofit board and disrupting that piety. But I promise you, if you can work toward this in your organization, you will have more effective and engaged board members. And yeah. probably you're looking for commitment. You know, that's what that honorarium, you know, uh, sets up is commitment. And by the way, you know, that's the model in the corporate sector, except the numbers were for a lot more zeros. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're not suggesting anything crazy. It's just people hear the idea of, oh, you're going to pay your board members and they go off the rails thinking that, you know, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. That's not what nonprofits are supposed to be about. Um, but it's no different than or, uh, offering an honorarium uh, for uh, someone who speaks at one of your events. I was a... a a pastor uh, for 11 years and did hundreds of weddings and funerals. And I always got an honorarium for doing a wedding, a wedding or a funeral. Is anybody scandalized by that? Yeah. Um, they were, it's just a way of saying thank you. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's expected, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, the name of this program is Major Gifts Ramp Up. In fact, and I'm gonna, we're going to dig in a little more detail and I call the four phases of resource development but can you talk a moment about the you all conduct major gift ramp up courses and presentations all around the country? Can you take a moment to share something about, you know, your programs? Yes, thank you. So Nano is a macro effort to change the nonprofit sector. On a micro level, we conduct two day nonprofit seminars called uh major gifts ramp up and you can go to nonprofitconferences.org. We do them in person. We do them virtually. Uh, in the chat, you'll see an email that you can use to get a scholarship code to any of the conferences. We'd love to have you as our guest. That's a $498 value that we're offering to participants today. And so uh, I'm going to be in Asheville, North Carolina, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Santa Barbara, California, Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, this South sounds Virginia. like you're running for office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so we love doing these two day events because it's an opportunity to convey the major gifts ramp up model, which is a 13 step model for major gifts that we've used for more than 35 years in all 50 states to raise over a billion dollars. And two days is what it takes to really dive in to learning how to implement this model in your nonprofit. Wow. Hey, let's, I like uh, organizing fundraising in the phases of discovery, you know, identifying who you're going to ask for money, cultivating how you forge a personal emotional bond between the prospect and your mission, the solicitation, you know, the who, what, when, where, and making the ask. And the stewardship, which is closing the loop of expressing your thanks and your appreciation, reporting back on results. So you can go back to Randa next year, not only ask her to renew her gift, but to increase it. So let's uh, reach into the major gift ramp up playbook. Let's talk about discovery. What do you all talk? How would you distill in a few minutes? what you uh, educate your attendees about discovering prospects. Yeah, so we call that prospect identification, and yeah. we encourage uh, organizations to build three prospect lists. 
first of all, their existing file. Um, I am shocked, Jim, at how often I work with organizations that have an existing file of donors that 500, 1,000, 2,000 records, and they haven't wealth screened that file. Mm. So the first thing that we encourage is to take your existing file, clean it up, have accurate records, name, address, telephone, email, and then wealth screen that file. We developed a tool called Donor Scope that allows you to wealth screen that file to return from Experian the wealth data on those individuals. So if you have a thousand records, you need to know where to start. Um, you're not just going to be able to call a thousand people to right. ask for a thousand major gifts. Once you wealth screen that file, that narrows it typically down to 15 to 20 percent. So if you have a thousand people, you're narrowing it down to 150 to 200 records. That's very manageable then and gives you a place to start for growing these major donor relationships. Then the second uh, file is a community file. We believe that most nonprofits are working in their communities and doing incredible things, but people don't know what's happening. And so we invite you to populate roughly 200 to 250 community members who are already serving on boards of other nonprofits in the area. All you have to do is go to the Community Foundation's website, the United Way's website, the Habitat for Humanity website, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, the community college, the local university. You will find the board members listed there, put them into a spreadsheet, find their home or business address, then what some nonprofits do foolishly, Jim, is they post their annual report that includes their highest donors that are recognized in their you annual report. You know what I say? Oh, man, you know, thank you very much. Right. So well, that's, that's a great your, place. Your secrets, right? Exactly. So that's a wonderful place to go looking at the annual report to find out who are the sponsors, who are the highest level donors, because people who are involved with other nonprofits and other charitable causes are always looking for their next project, and they would love to hear about your organization. And then the third list that we build is a download list where we use DonorScope to look at the names um, of millionaires within a particular area. So we can take any zip code and do a radius search and download the names and addresses of millionaires in any geographical area. And you would be astounded at how many millionaires are out there. People are always surprised. And at they the live next door. And they live surprisingly modest lifestyles, right? Correct. Um, we don't use uh, we don't like to use home value as a criteria because you could have an older couple that lives in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar ranch home that they paid off 20 years ago. Yeah. But they're worth yeah. millions. So yeah. we look at uh, net worth and income producing assets when we download this file and we combine those three lists then and we invite roughly twenty five hundred households to a non fundraising awareness event. This is the way we then acquire and begin to cultivate new donors. Okay, let's move to that phase. You have identified your most likely uh, probable donors. What do you all teach on cultivating them? So first of all, there should be a non-fundraising awareness event, which is an opportunity for people to come and hear about the mission of your organization without being asked for money because we haven't earned the right yet to ask them for a major gift. So they self-qualify when they show up to this non-fundraising awareness luncheon. Uh, we have a tight timed agenda. They We take them to the mountaintop for the mission and impact of the organization. And then we conclude that event by saying, if you've learned today that this organization can help you achieve your goals for our community, we look forward to visiting with you personally. Then we go into our chapter eight, which is prospect cultivation. We're going to call everyone who attended the event or everyone who wanted to attend but could not yeah. and set up face-to-face -face meetings with them, coffee, lunch, cocktails, dinner, to ask them questions about themselves. So prospect cultivation does not begin with a data dump of here is how wonderful our organization is. Instead, it, it begins with asking them about themselves, finding out more about the individual. And as you learn about them, 
where they grew up, wh what they where they went to school, where they worked, what they like to do for fun. You will find then natural connections about them to the work that you're doing. Too many nonprofit for professionals get in a meeting with a millionaire and they start spewing out data and statistics yeah. thinking that knowledge is the key to unlocking a major gift. That's only part of the equation. The key to unlocking a major gift is listening to the major donor. Yeah. Okay. We're getting ready. We've cultivated them. What does major gifts ramp up teach about the solicitation phase? Okay. Thank you for asking. So, then we narrow our list to our top 100 yeah. uh, who can be uh, asked for a major gift to the campaign. And we set up one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, typically with a cabinet member involved, a campaign cabinet member who's involved and a staff member involved in those conversations. And then we listen our way to the gifts um, using the magic questions. Yeah. So, and the magic questions start with, may I have your permission? Jim, may I have your permission to review our case for support? May I have your permission to ask you what interests you most about this effort? Can you share with me where you feel connected in the work that we're doing? What moves your heart the most? Jim, May I have your permission to ask you to consider a commitment to this campaign? Can you mentor me through the best next steps for you to join this effort? So these are some of the magic questions that we ask. Those are donor. golden nuggets. Those are golden nuggets. That allow them to be in control of the conversation. Yeah. We're just asking questions and guiding them through it in the same way that a financial advisor asks questions of someone who's going to be invested in the stock market. We need to ask the same questions of someone who's investing in philanthropy. So that's a very critical, I guess, part of the move management cycle. And how does that lead to the actual solicitation? So once we've gone through all of the questions, we get to the point of saying, Jim, would you consider a three-year commitment to our campaign? Yeah. Uh, and then if you say yes, then we say we've prepared a written proposal for you, Jim, where we would like you to consider a multi-year commitment to programs and operations, a one-time stretch gift to our capital project, and then, Jim, for you to include our organization in your estate plans. And this three-part ask leads to a total amount, then, that you're committing to this campaign cycle. Mm -hmm. I love that holistic approach, rather than breaking them into separate components. Okay. It gives, Go ahead. It, gives the, it gives the donor the freedom to break it up if they want to. You know, some donors may say, well, I'm not giving to all three buckets. I may only give to capital or I may only give to program. But we have to give them those opportunities and then see where they want to go with their major gift. It sounds like throughout this process, you're putting the donor in charge. That is the essence of donor-centric fundraising. They are our customers, and we are here to serve them. Okay, let's say you get to that wonderful word, yes, and you get some commitments. How do you all teach about the stewardship phase? So we have a commitment form that we encourage organizations to use when someone makes a major gift commitment. And so it begins, first of all, with properly filing that form in the office and then making a copy of that form and sending a thank you note to the donor. So you make a, uh, a copy of that form, that commitment form, and it's a way of saying thank you and a may way of also reminding them uh, to what they committed. Uh, I am in favor once they make their first gift of hand delivering that tax letter. Mm. I don't think it's good for, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollar gift to mail a, a tax <laughs> letter. That's um, a good point. Why, why not sit down yeah. with them and thank them in person? We're also in favor of having 
uh, a line item in your budget for donor stewardship. Send them flowers, get them chocolate, give them candles and soaps and lotions. You know, we love on them not to buy their next gift, but to show our appreciation. You know, I call that get them them in our hug. Right. And in every other aspect of our lives, we spend money on gifts. So why do we have this pie? piety in the nonprofit sector that we're not supposed to spend money loving on our donors, that is part of cultivating a relationship. And it's something that we should put tremendous time and effort into. And then, and this is where a lot of nonprofits also drop the ball, Jim, I'm sorry to say, after they've given their gift, we need to report back on the impact of what their money has done. Um, Jim, thank you so much for your $100,000 gift to our after-school program. Let me show you some pictures yeah. and and some stories about where we were able to put your money to work. We'd love for you to visit our after-school program, Jim, and um, to see the work firsthand. That is a way of reporting on outcomes, on stewarding then toward the next gift. And too many nonprofits take the money And then a year later, the donor hasn't heard anything about the impact that they made other than getting a newsletter or an email. And that's not simply not personal enough. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, let's get a perspective of a different generation. I'd like to uh, uh, bring in Randa into the discussion, uh, who is a card carrying millennial. And I think, Randa, you have some questions for our special guest. Yeah, yeah, kind of straying from the current subject a little bit. I'm curious about the the behavior of some of your major gift donors, just in your experience, if you've noticed any like major primary differences uh, in the philanthropic behavior of like Gen Z and millennials and your boomers, if you have to approach it differently. Oh, I- absolutely. So uh, builders and boomers are more likely to give Uh, because it's the right thing to do, Uh, whereas uh, younger generations, Gen X, Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen Z, millennials, um, they want to understand that their money is being put to work immediately to make a difference in the community. So they're less interested in uh, a general gift. They are driven by specific campaigns that give to specific causes to make a specific difference. Yeah. So what's your advice then on inspiring them to do that, whether it's money or just volunteering or whatever it is? So part of involving any major donor, but particularly younger generations, is to give them opportunities to experience the programs firsthand, Mm -hmm. um, for them to come and interact with the kids, to interact with veterans, um, to be a part of the program at the food bank so that they can see firsthand what's going on, and then offering them an opportunity to enter into a giving circle or a giving club or uh, a giving organization where over time they can step up their gift to eventually get to uh, a major gift outcome. Brenda, I think you got a little more ammunition. Yeah, I had one other question about, um, which is kind of funny because of the room that we happen to be in right now, but Generally, uh, perhaps outside of this panelist screen, do you think that Gen Z millennials, all of us, are more receptive or not to the produ- sort of the provocative thoughts that you have on nonprofits? Uh, well, I like to think they're more receptive because we're tired of the BS, um, yeah. you know, and and we're tired of the institutionalism that has come with uh, the traditional view of the nonprofit sector. Uh, we are about results and growth and action. Uh, we are are not about uh, wasting time and wasting money. And so uh, I think we have an appeal at Nano to the younger generations because they see that we are here to serve them. We're here to get things done and we're not expecting them to serve us like some other organizations expect. Yeah. Okay. Um- I'm old enough to remember an advertising campaign that says, you want to know what a car is like? Ask a man or a woman who drives one. And in that spirit, we've lined up a few nonprofit leaders 
who have uh, benefited from being students in the major gift ramped up uh, programs. And I want to see, I hope we, uh, John's going to get ready to bring him on camera. Uh, George McCandless, CEO of uh, United Way Central Georgia. Are you there? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we are uh, a United Way, obviously. And, you know, our uh, superpower was running company campaigns. Yeah. Where we go out and do presentations. And we were not very good at individual, uh, especially high wealth major donors. Um, and as the landscape has changed over the years, not just for our United Way, but for a lot of United Ways, uh, the company campaigns revenue has started to decline. And so we realized the need to bring in individual high wealth donor, individual donors. And just by chance, I was introduced to uh, Major Gifts Ramp Up by another United Way CEO, and we implemented the program. We started uh, almost three years ago, uh, not too long after COVID. Um, and, and we had great success. We had a, a couple of uh, very successful uh, ask events. I think the one thing that we learned, uh, maybe the best thing from the program for us was it taught us how to go out. It, it you know, the old saying that, uh, you know, a, 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 a goal without a plan is just a dream. Yeah. This gave us a plan and a strategy to be able to go out and solicit and find who these high wealth individuals are in our community. And then, how that we uh, approach them. Uh, I think Lewis mentioned earlier about the case for support. Um, we had not done that exactly, you know, in, in the same format that uh, they teach. And, and that's been a great help, uh, not only, you know, in that, but we use that in almost everything that we do these days. Well, thank you. And by the way, thank you for the service and leadership you provide the nonprofit sector. Let's go to another testimonial. Uh, Lauren Wilkie, CEO of Safe Light. Where are you today? Hendersonville, North Carolina. Okay. Um, tell us a little about Safe Light and then tell us about a lesson that you learned from the Major Gifts Ramp Up program. Absolutely. So Safe Flight is an agency that's community-based serving survivors of abuse, violence, and exploitation. We've been doing this for 40 years, and we've been looking to grow so that we can have more programming, more services to serve survivors. So when I started here four years ago of our 40 years, I knew um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a licensed huh. running non- Hooray for social workers. <laughs> I have three licenses to practice and to build, and I know how to do program evaluation. I knew coming in, I needed to work on my skills for stewardship. And also, I came in with a, um, a very green, first in the role, a couple months in, development director. So we're blind, lean the blind. I said, let's learn together. <laughs> and let's bring in the marketing person that we're adding to our team to learn with us. So the goal was to figure out how we could increase our individual giving. And so with a lot of work, I'm, I came into a mess. There had to be a lot of restructuring, right people in the right roles, right policy and procedures. We have over four years doubled our annual budget. Um, we're sitting now at just around 3.7 million. And we tripled individual giving and doubled our grants. Wow. Yeah. i uh, tell you what. Uh, that must make you and your organization, you're able to just do more of your mission because yeah. that's what, more money equals more mission. That's right. And thank you for the service and leadership you provide the nonprofit sector. Let's see if we can bring in uh, Chris Virgin, founder and CEO of Allies and Youth. Come on, there you are. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thank you. I'm chomping at the bit to tell you what I got well, to Well, guess you. what? You chomp no longer. And, uh, and it's can you take a, it's, a moment to tell us about Allies? I will, but I want to tell you first, it's 94 degrees here in Dallas. 
Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I get a feeling you're in an air-conditioned uh, room right now. I am. But anyways, uh, what profound lesson did you all learn from the Major Gift Ramp-Up program? I'm telling you, these guys, I was ready to quit. That's not good. That's I was ready good. to quit. I couldn't join another Sunday school class. I couldn't join another Rotary Club. Uh -huh. was, and everything, every day of the week, I was going and networking and doing what I thought to do. And we went to uh, the first nano conference in uh, 2017. And, and I'm telling you, these guys, these guys changed everything for wow. allies and youth development. We help orphans now in 67 countries. Wow. The world over 20,000 a month. And these guys got me out of the garage. I was in my uh, working in my garage. They got us into our first building. They got me where I could pay people, pay staff. And I put together, Jim, for you, just the yeah. numbers for you to uh, contemplate. Okay, please share them. I'm going to share them for you. First six years that the Allies was, uh, was working, we raised $1.2 million. Okay. Little nonprofit, little, little startup. In the last seven years, we've raised $6.7 million. Now, if you count this year and we hit our goal, you could add another $2 million to it. So for, for a little uh, startup with no, you know, no celebrity power, nothing. all it was was these guys giving me a plan and saying, this is the way we think you should do it, Chris. And if you will follow this, we will help you. I was so dumb about all of this stuff. I, di I didn't know anything about fundraising and What's things this, like this that. Is another word, rather than dumb, I don't know, naive. Okay. I, I was ignorant to, 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 to how to do this. The, the schooling I had was the schooling of church, being in church and doing, but it's totally yeah. different. And and so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we'll have a banquet and we'll have some T-shirts there to sell. You know that, you know, let's do another skeet shoot. Who wants to do that or a golf tournament? Yeah. And it just kills you. But these guys gave me a plan. They gave me uh, the tools that we needed to be able to for our co-founder to quit her job at University of Texas at Arlington and work for us full time. It gave it, we've got a development staff of five now, three full-time, two part-time, looking for another full-time if anybody out there is looking for <laughs> something. <laughs> but Jim, these guys are the real deal. I love uh, Lewis. I love Jimmy. I love these guys. They and Christy, they, they will help you. They will help you. Yeah. You have to listen. You got to do the work. Yeah. Well, that, that is a very powerful testimonial. I know we have John Keeper. Uh, John uh, is CEO of Valley Interfaith. Can you tell us quickly about Valley Interfaith and what lesson you learned from Major Gift, uh, Major Gift's ramp up? Well, I will uh, condense it very quickly. I will tell you, uh, this old dog learned some new tricks. Uh, yeah. Quite frankly, when I came into this a couple of years ago, I've been in this business 30 plus years. Uh, worked with professional athletes uh, from the NFL to Major League ba Baseball and had quite a lot of success. And then I retired and took over Valley Interfaith. And I'll tell you, this place just confounded me. And so I hit every wall. Everything I'd done before didn't work. Had a dysfunctional board. So it wasn't just about the money. It was also about organizational development. Uh -huh. And so had we not have been successful in our campaign we would not have had this year. So when we began Major Gifts, uh, uh, Major Gifts Ramp Up two years ago, our we worked the process. We started to become introduced to people that had never heard of Valley Interfaith, even though it had been around 60 years. Wow. And we went from about $250,000 and me being chief cook and bottle washer and everything else uh, to now expanding our staff the property that we were in and rented for years was given to us last September, officially in this this past February. We took deed and we have come in contact with uh, significant uh, people, philanthropists in the community because of this model and the focus. And, and I will tell you the biggest thing that I take away is 
the understanding of earning the right to ask. Uh, that is probably one of the most powerful uh, lessons I've learned outside of uh, Peter Brinkerhofer, who's a nonprofit guru, would say the three most important things for a nonprofit is mission, mission, mission. And oh, by the way, no money, no mission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John, thank you for sharing. Uh, Lewis, these are some very powerful testimonials. We have a few minutes left. I wanted to work in my question. Um, what's your perspective on the impact, both internally and externally, of a nonprofit getting its first or next million dollar gift? So internally, it's confidence. Uh, I think that's yeah, the, yeah. the biggest piece for that million dollar gift is the confidence that you can raise six and seven figure gifts. And so you get your first gift and then you know you can do it. Then you do it again and again and again. So I can't underrate how important confidence is internally to an organization. Yeah. And then externally, uh, money chases after money. Yeah. So then you're able to show other organizations, companies, and other philanthropists that we've received a million dollar gift, and here's how we put it to work to change and save lives in our community. Then that leverages conversations for your next seven figure gift. Right. I'll tell you what, we have a few minutes left, but I want to close with one of your favorite topics. Can you talk about the advantages of nano versus CFRE credentials? Yeah, so credentialing at nano is uh, very cost effective. It's $100 per cr credential. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, and it's a lifetime credentialing. There are no subscription fees every year. You don't have to get recertified. Um, and it's an open book test. You have 30 days to take it. And it covers every aspect of nonprofit management and fundraising. And so the benefit of credentialing through Nano is we're not trying to see how good you are at taking a test. Yeah. Uh, we want to convey a set of information. So uh, CFRE has been around a long time. It's the old model of credentialing. And with the three credentials that we offer, we make it affordable. We make it uh, effective. And we make it material that you can use over and over and over again in your nonprofit career. Wow. So I'll tell you what, um, first of all, uh, Lewis, this has been in one of the richest hours since January 24th when we had Jimmy LaRose. And by the way, Jimmy, we are so elated that you're back to 100% health. Uh, John, can we put up Lewis's contact information? And by the way, they can reach out to you if they want to learn. Is that right, Lewis? More about the major gift wrap up programs. If they want to learn about uh, nano credentialing, they can reach out to you. And yeah, please email or text me. Um, the best ways to reach me, and I'm happy to uh, provide you a scholarship to our two day event and answer any questions that you have. First of all, Lewis, this has really been one of the richest hours we've had. And I want to thank you not only for sharing the most valuable all gifts, your time. As you get older, you realize the time is more valuable for money because you can replace money. You can never replace time. I've learned a lot past the, uh, the, over the last hour. And Lewis, we want to thank you for the leadership and the inspiration. And along with Jimmy, the truth telling you have provided the nonprofit sector. And I say truth telling is a commodity that's all too rare in our society. So thank you for your service and leadership. And to our learning community audience of the nonprofit families, of uh, CEOs, executive directors, board members, volunteers, directors of development, uh, donors, thank you for the role you play every day in our communities to touch, improve, and save more lives. Our series continues on Wednesday, October 16th, and we have the effervescent um, Marcy Hyde, who is the founder of the Artful Asking, and she's topic is the joy of asking, and nobody is more effervescent than uh, Marcy Hyde. So again, Lewis, uh, it has been a privilege, and I gotta warn you, um, Randall will tell you when you do such a fantastic job like you just did over the last hour, 
we're going to ask you and expect you back, okay? I'd be happy to come back anytime, Jim. And uh, let's bring Major Gus Ramp up to San Antonio. Let's do an let's in-person do that. event. Let's yeah. do it. The, the, the River Rock would be a perfect place for it. Okay. All right. 2025, here we come. Here we go. Listen, and everyone, be well. And we'll see you on October 16th. And uh, a great, great uh, learning community discussion. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Uh, we are going to post in a matter of one or two minutes a 1,300 character space summary. And by the way, that's the limit on LinkedIn. Facebook will let you go longer of the major points that Lewis has made today. And then John does his special spin dry. And we'll be sending a recording to everybody who registered. And we'll also be posting it on social media. And, Lewis, we hope that you'll share it as broadly as you can do, too. So uh, the, the, the uh, wisdom that we uh, shared over the last hour will live on, you know, through technology. So, uh, everyone, thank you for sharing us, for joining us. And, Lewis, I can't wait to speak with you again. Randa, always a pleasure, and thank you for your role in this program. And to everyone, be safe and be well. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Randa. Thanks, everybody.